Well, welcome again to Grace Chapel. My name is Joshua Manny. I'm the pastor here. I'm so glad that you guys are here with us in worship today. I just need to say this. Uh, I came ready to preach, and then, I'm just joking, I'm still ready to preach. But here's, here's the thing that I find very interesting, though. Uh, we had more people on Daylight Saving Time Sunday than like the last Sunday, like the Sunday following spring break. So I don't know what that's about, but anyway, we're here. So, I mean, if y'all like me, you're probably tired from running around with kids all week. So, you know, there is a word from the Lord uh, because it's not for me. Kids are exhausting. All right? I just, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to unravel in front of y'all. I'm just like, we're here, right? There's a, we have a newborn. Bria's here. JJ's here for the first time. So that's exciting. Um, and we turned six weeks today, seven weeks, seven weeks, seven weeks. Great. I can't count. Seven weeks. All right. So this is what's done. Ow, I'm going to start saying things out. What week is this of the series? Week four? four? Four. Okay, great. How many Sundays have we been in divine disruption? Y'all probably know better than I do. Four? Four. Thank you, Jeff. Jeff knows because Jeff makes the slides. So we've been in divine disruption for four weeks. And we have been in the season of Lent. Is anyone excited about the season of Lent? Yeah, see, I knew it was going to happen. I knew, I, knew, I knew who I was talking to. All right. <laughs> um, but we talked a lot about what it means for us to be in this season. We talked a little bit about uh, what it means for us to set goals as we journey through Lent, to not just walk through Lent aimlessly and saying, well, I'm going to give up this without understanding that we are giving up something so that we can help better contribute to the outcomes for others, right? We talked about a different way of looking at fasting. We deprive ourselves so that we can help meet the needs of others. And so as we have been on this Lenten journey, we are coming up on Holy Week. I don't know if y'all know that or not, but Kim was sharing dates that are literally about 14 days away. So um, as we approach the conclusion of the Lenten season and get ready to celebrate Holy Week, I know that many of us have made significant progress. That's okay if you haven't. I'm, 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 there's no judgment here. Uh-huh. Right. I've made significant progress toward achieving uh, the goals that we set. Uh, some of us are reading our Bibles more. Some of us are probably praying more. Some of us are probably re-engaged with our small groups if we haven't done so. Some of us have showed up more to worship on Sunday mornings than we have in a while. We have made progress. So even if you don't feel like you have, you probably have. All right? Can we, can we agree on that this morning? Yeah. It may not feel like you've made progress, but, you know, you probably have. Even if you're doing something more than you were doing it before, that's progress. That is indeed progress. But there is this temptation as we get toward the end of Lent, or really the middle, because it happened to me, I don't know about y'all. Spring break became my excuse to just, like, ignore the things I said I was going to do. Yeah, I know. We talked about this. Part of it was like, I'm going to spend less money outside. But then when you have a whole bunch of kids at home, it's like, actually, let's not use the energy (laughs) to do the things at home. But it becomes an opportunity to kind of begin to revert. Or even when we get to the end of Lent, it's almost as if, all right, well, Lent is over. Now I can go back to doing what I was doing before. And one of the greatest opponents of progress is not to revert, right? It's not reversion. A lot of us think, well, the opposite of progress is going backwards. But the greatest opponent to progress is not to go in the opposite direction. It's to stop moving altogether. It is to stop moving altogether. Before you begin reverting, you just stop. And so the most significant opposition that we face to our progress is complacency. It is getting comfortable with where we are. Many of us know this, right? We've set New Year's resolutions to go to the gym more, to work out more. And then as soon as we start seeing a little bit of change, it's like, all right, I look good. And all of a sudden, next morning, you miss the workout. Morning after that, you miss another workout. Am I speaking to anybody this morning? I'm just talking to myself. All right, I'm I'm just making sure I'm in the right house. All right. um, And so sometimes it is easy to just stop because we've we've seen the results of our efforts and to say, okay, that's good. And part of becoming complacent in some ways, may not be getting distracted by the fact that we see some results. Sometimes complacency comes about as a result of believing that this is as good as it's going to get. Right? Believing that this is as good as it's going to get. It's not going to get any better than this. I'm not going to lose any more weight than this. All right? I'm not going to develop any more biceps or triceps or 
abs, which is like the most difficult area to develop muscle in that people can see. <laughs> right, I'm not going to do any more than this, so I'm going to accept the fact this is as good as it gets. But I choose to live by the words of Norman Vincent Peale, who said this, and you guys know this quote, he says, shoot for the moon, because even if you miss, you'll land among the stars. Shoot for the moon, because even if you miss, you will land among the stars. Many of us have lived through enough disappointment, though, to be permanently discouraged from aiming for anything other than that which is directly in front of us. I'll say that again. Some of us have lived through enough disappointment to be permanently discouraged from aiming for that which is beyond what we can currently see. We have been disappointed enough times to say, I'm not actually going to try any harder than this. I'm going to accept what's been given to me, and that's about it. But I wonder if we can extend that conversation a little bit today. That sometimes we are not just discouraged and become complacent, but sometimes we're discouraged enough to be like the little kid who bought our ball to the park to play. And instead of sitting on the sideline and watching everyone else play, we just go home with our ball. So instead of sitting on the sideline watching the game, right, saying, this is good as I'm going to keep losing, we just decide to leave altogether and stop participating altogether. But what happens when we go home? Most of the time, the reason we would return home is because home is a place that is safe and secure. It is not a place often filled with hostility and disappointment. Most of the time we go home because it feels safe. But what happens when home is a place that is not safe, but home is a place that is actually hostile and riddled with other people's insecurity? What happens when home is not safe, when home is not secure, but home is riddled with other people's insecurities and is hostile to your progress. I don't know about you, but I would pack up my stuff and go. Typically, we would pack up our stuff and leave. I don't know about y'all, but I'm a transplant. I am not from North Texas. So when things got a little bit out of hand, I packed my stuff And left. And left. And not only do we leave, I think sometimes we make this inward commitment that also says, I won't go back. Right? Not only do we leave, we refuse to return. I think sometimes the reason we become complacent is because we haven't really made that commitment internally to not revert or not return back to what our life once was or the way we lived our life before. So I want to talk to you this morning about not going back. We're going to turn to the Gospel of John, which we've been in for the past couple of weeks, the Gospel of John chapter 9. We're going to read verses 1 through 3 and then 6 through 8. This is a very long story, so I'm not going to read the entire thing. We've been doing this every week. I'm not going to read the entire story. I'm going to read part of it. I'm going to talk to you about the rest of the story. If you want to know the specifics, I'm going to encourage you to go read it at home. Okay? I'm going to read from the New Revised Standard Version. Listen now for a word from the Lord. As he walked along, he saw a, bland, a mind, I mean, oh my gosh, as he walked along, <laughs> he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Then Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. Verse number six, when he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for this opportunity to be in worship, to be with one another. God, we ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds to receive what your spirit is saying to the church this day. 
God, allow me to play the background as you take center stage. Not my words, but your words. Not my will, but your will be done. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. I won't go back. I won't go back. So I want to talk to you about a couple of different things when we talk about not going back, not reverting, not returning. Um, the first thing I want to talk about is not going back to looking for places to place blame. It's to not go back to looking for places to place blame for our circumstances or the circumstances of others. For our circumstances or the circumstances of others. There are some situations in our lives where we are trying to increase our understanding of cause and effect, right? What caused this to happen, which is what happens in the relationship with Jesus' conversation with his disciples. They're walking past and they see somebody who was born blind and they're trying to understand. And in trying to understand, they ask about the cause. What made this come to pass? Was it a sin that this man committed or was it a sin that his parents committed? They're trying to understand why this man was born with a disability. And at that point in time, in history, that was a fair question to ask. Based on how they understood the world, that was a fair question for them to ask, in which is, why is this happening to this man? Something must have happened to make this a reality. And I think sometimes we look for places to place blame because we are trying to provide ourselves with some level of relief. With some level of relief. And I don't know about you, but I'm a person that asks a lot of questions. I'm really like a toddler. Everything is why. And Bria will tell you, like, it's why did this happen? Why did that happen that way? What do you think about why that happened that way? All right? I'm like, I am very good for having those conversations. And I noticed something. Is that no matter how much relief I get in the moment for trying to understand why what happened happened, oftentimes it doesn't change the circumstances. Spending time trying to understand why what happened happened doesn't change the fact that it happened. It doesn't change the fact that it happened. And better yet, it doesn't change the effects. This man is blind and they want to know why. And here's what Jesus says to them. It doesn't matter. (laughs) Essentially what Jesus says. Why he's blind is less important than what God can do as a result of his blindness. Uh Uh-oh. Why he was born blind is less important than what God can do in response to that. And I just wonder if we could allow God space enough to begin responding to situations and circumstances that we are busy trying to understand. I just wonder if we can stop asking why long enough for us to imagine what might be possible if we invite God to respond. So, Let's not go back to investing too much energy. It doesn't mean that sometimes asking why is not helpful, right? Don't hear me say that. Sometimes trying to understand why what happened happened is important so that you don't repeat the same mistakes, right? Sometimes that's important, right? Particularly with generational trauma, it's important to understand, right, if you have some sort of disposition to abusing substances or something, like somebody in your family may have also suffered with something similar, or mental health, like something in your family may have also happened to somebody else. And so sometimes it's important to ask why. Don't hear me say that you shouldn't ask why. What I'm saying is that that is not going to solve your problem. It will help you better understand, but better understanding doesn't always change the circumstances, okay? 
the thing I also find intriguing about this is that sometimes we have been conditioned to accept blame for things that are not our fault. We have been conditioned to accept blame for things that are not our fault. You remember when they asked the man, well, they asked Jesus about the man and said, why was he born blind? Did he sin or his parents? I want y'all to think about that. Did he sin or his parents? He was born blind. Is it his fault that he was born blind? Did anyone else catch that? He was born this way. It must be his fault that he was born into those circumstances. It's amazing that many of us here in some ways have been conditioned to accept that we are responsible for where we started life. We have taken on responsibility for things that we didn't have any agency over. So the blame here is twofold for me in this text, right? The first part is they're trying to understand why what happened happened. And Jesus is like, ah, you're never going to understand it. Let's respond to the circumstance, right? Then the second part is they are trying to assign blame to, some, to a man for something that he had no control over. And I don't know about y'all, but we live in a world in which people are often blamed for the circumstances that they were born into. But scripture teaches us that there's actually nothing new under the sun, right? This is not new. It's been happening since the first century or so. People trying to blame others for how they were born or what they were born into. And like I said before, I think for some of us, we've been conditioned to accept blame for things that are not our fault, for things that we did not have any control over. And so I think one of the things that we are, we are free from as we begin to follow Christ in deeper ways and in renewed ways is being free from accepting blame for things that are not our fault. And as kids, you know, y'all know most of life is just like unlearning childhood trauma. This is most of life, just like, like responding to childhood trauma. We've been talking about this for a couple months now. Oh, yeah, thanks, thanks, Zach, because I was like, I'm, I'm getting excited, and I don't want to talk. Uh, thank you, sir. I'm just trying to make sure it's off. I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying to make sure it's off. Is this better? It's less, it's less frizzy and stuff? Good. Praise God. So um, here's the thing. This man had spent most of his life accepting blame for something that was his, wasn't his fault because other people couldn't understand why it happened to him. And it's amazing that we have often struggled with the same things. It's not our fault that we were born into a certain socioeconomic class. It's not our fault that we were born into a certain racial ethnic demographic. It's not our fault that we were born into a certain uh, geographic area. I don't blame y'all for being born in Texas, those of y'all who were born here. You're welcome. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but it's not our fault. We have to free ourselves from accepting blame for things that are not our fault. Right? Cool. Let's move on to the next thing, which is choosing to not revert back to feigning ignorance. Here's what I mean. When we're reading the text, we see that the people who now are observing this man in the fullness of his healing are busy trying to confirm his identity because they are accustomed to seeing him through a certain lens. They are accustomed to seeing him a certain way so they can't see him as who he currently is. Because who he currently is, is in contention with what they thought they knew about him. Has anyone ever been in a situation where people can't accept you for who you are now because they think they've known you longer than you've known yourself? Or they've observed you a particular way? 
they begin to question him about his identity. They don't even believe it's him. Because the person he's appearing to be now is so much different from the person he used to be. Let's be honest about it. Come on now. Did he really look all that different? Did he really look all that different? Probably not. But I wonder if this is the first time that they could actually see him beyond his circumstance. If for them, he had become a fixture in their community, but not an active participant. Hold down to that. We'll get back to it later. Okay, hold on to that. We'll get back there. This community of people do not believe that it's him. And you know, the thing that gets, gets me about this is not only do they struggle, they bring him to the religious authorities who also struggle. They don't believe this man's own report about himself. And so they go and ask his parents. <laughs> this is a grown man who's telling you, yes, I was born blind, but now I see. And they're like, are you sure about that? <laughs> are you sure that that's your testimony? <laughs> Anybody ever been in a situation where people try to ask you whether or not what you said about how God moved in your life is actually true? That's where he's at. And so here's what he does. He tells them his story because they really want to know why. Remember, we started off with this. They want to know how this man was able to see because they didn't believe it and they didn't even believe his testimony. How was he able to see? There is no way that this man is the same man that we used to know because he's not the same, he, same way he used to be. Y'all know when I get somewhere and I, and I think I want to say something, but I decide not to? I'm going to say it. Okay. <laughs> we talked about accepting blame for things that are not our fault. But I also think sometimes we accept other people's perception of who we are as our reality. They said, was this not the man who used to sit and beg? They didn't say anything about his blindness. They said nothing about what he was actually suffering through, but said something about how his suffering caused him to show up in their society. They remembered him, watch this, as dependent and stationary. As someone who was dependent on the goodwill of others and as someone who did not move from his place. Can I say it a different way? They saw him as lazy. The man is blind. Where was he going to get a job in the first century? Their society didn't have the tools to help him get a job, to help him take care of himself. And instead of seeing themselves as responsible for him as part of their community, they blame him for how he's born. For how he's born. I'm just going to keep circling around that. I'll let y'all interpret it on your own. They don't have the tools as a society. And instead of, of looking at him, like the people that live with him, the people from the, out, the outsiders came in and was like, oh, why is he blind? Right? And they keep walking too, or attempt to. Jesus, Jesus interacts with him. But they would have walked too. They're outsiders. The people that are inside the community are used to seeing him this way. And instead of seeing him as someone who was struggling with caring for himself, they saw him as a nuisance. And I know there are times in our lives where other people have seen the effects of our private struggles 
and can only see us as the thing that caused them harm and disappointment. Other people have observed the public behavior or public outcomes of something that we struggled with privately and have yet to release us from what they observed. I'm in the wrong room. I'm in the wrong room. Imagine not being released from your mistakes. I'm not saying this man was a mistake or had mistakes. I'm just talking about us, right? It's a good way for us to learn. I don't know about you, but I've made some bad choices. I've made some bad choices. And in my early 30s, I'm going to make about 100,000 more, okay? I have plenty of room in front of me to still make bad choices. And I wouldn't be where I am today if I allowed other people's inability to let go of my mistakes to keep me from moving forward. Does anyone else have that testimony this morning? Does anyone else have that testimony that you wouldn't be where you are today if you allowed what other people observed about you based on something you were going through in private to be how you see yourself? I'm up on time, so here, here's the thing. I, I have one more point. I told you I felt like preaching today. That didn't mean I wanted to talk long, but here I am. So, um, <laughs> last thing I want to talk about not going back to is vying for acceptance in places in which you are not welcome. We're going to read the last little chunk of this story. It's going to be the gospel of John again, chapter 9. We're going to start at verse 26 or 24. I can't remember. I'm going to read what's on the screen. So listen now for a word from the Lord. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already, but you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? <laughs> then they reviled him, saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. Then the man answered, here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. And we know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. And if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And they answered him, you were born entirely in sins, and you were trying to teach us? And they drove him out. This is going to take me longer to explain, but I'm going to try to do it quickly. I don't want to lose y'all, so it is what it is. All right. Um, we have to learn how to stop vying for acceptance in communities that do not accept us. This man told his testimony of change how he had been transformed. His physical sight was non-existent, and now it is clear that the people who had a really hard time seeing him the entire time are the ones who saw him sitting and begging. They had a hard time seeing him when he was blind, and they have a hard time seeing him now that he can see. They couldn't see him before, and they don't see him now. But the thing that really took me aback was the way in which they responded to him when they couldn't understand what took place. They responded to him with what did we talked about earlier, hostility. And what we began to see is that their own insecurities popped up. 
They said to him, how dare you lecture us? You are the one who was born into sin. Okay. Scripture teaches us that all have sin. And yet these people have found themselves taking their own insecurities and projecting them onto him. We talked a little bit about how there are people in the text in these gospels that have a hard time losing control. They're used to being in authority and used to being in power, and Jesus comes and kind of begins to take that away. This is very disruptive to their society. And this man is there telling the story because he belongs to his community. We skipped over part of the story, but here's what I find very, very important. They went and asked the man's parents. I brought that up a little bit. They went and asked the man's parents if this was their son and if he, had, did, if, if he was indeed born blind. And they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, well, how can he see? And they didn't answer their question. They, they deflected and said, go ask him. He's old enough to answer his own question. And the scripture tells us that the reason they didn't answer that query was because of the fact that they knew if they answered in the affirmative about Jesus, that they too would be kicked out of the synagogue. Their whole lives, this community failed to accept their blind son. And they don't want to answer a question because they don't want to be kicked out. They've been in the community. Their family really hasn't been treated as equal. And yet they're still afraid to leave. This man answers in the affirmative because he knows something that his parents didn't. But better yet, let me say this. He received something that his parents didn't. Y'all ready for this? In the beginning of the text, we saw that Jesus put this mud on his eyes. And the reason that this was such a big issue for the Pharisees was because there were people that did magic using the same things. They also used mud and clay to do magic. And they were like, oh, this man's a sinner. There's no way he can redeem what others have used without God and try to say that God can work through it. Uh oh. Jesus has a way of redeeming the irredeemable, doesn't he? And so he, he uses this, this tool that other people have used without God, without the Holy Spirit working through it. And so that's part of the problem for them. They're like, oh, no. Can't be. Can't be God because he did it the wrong way. And so here's the thing that happens. After Jesus puts the clay over his eyes, Jesus sends him to the pool named Siloam that is translated as sent. As sent. Now, a lot of commentators will say, well, that, that is about Jesus and how Jesus was sent from God into the world. I want to kind of take that one step further today, just for our use this morning. Not only was Jesus sent, but Jesus sent him. I'm going to talk about this more. Here we go. Jesus sent him, not just to his place of healing, but Jesus sent him back to the community that didn't know him fully so that he could testify about what God had done. And not only did Jesus send him, Jesus called him out. The reason that this man is over it is what it seems like in the text. He's like, y'all are, I'm, I had enough with y'all. Y'all, I'm over it. Let me tell y'all about yourselves. He wasn't afraid of being kicked out because he had already been called out. He wasn't afraid of being kicked out of the community because he had already been called out of it. Imagine you and I trying to be accepted by people or by communities that God has already called us out of. Y'all know if you trace the etymology of the word ecclesiology or ecclesial, you go back to Greek, it's ecclesia, which means called out. I know y'all are Bible scholars. I know y'all know. It means called out. It means called out. They couldn't kick him out because God had already called him out. 
They thought they were doing something, but all they were doing were confirming what God had already done. And I wonder if one of the reasons we can stop vying for acceptance in places that never saw us or never accepted us is because God has already called us out. They kicked him out thinking they were doing something to him. But Jesus had sent him to his healing, sent him back to the community to testify, and then called him out from that community. I think one of the hardest things for us to accept as we journey on to perfection, Christian perfection it is, is that there are places that we won't be able to go back to because God called us out. There are relationships that we will not be able to restore because God called us out. There are friends that we won't be able to reconnect to because God called us out. You know, Jay-Z said something that I really, really, really appreciate. Uh, Jay-Z said this. He said, people always come up to you and say, well, man, you changed. Like, I worked this hard to stay the same. <laughs> Imagine encountering God being transformed, released from your suffering, only to revert back to who you used to be before you knew better. All because you don't want to lose your friends. I'm just here this morning, I promise. I'm just here. But imagine that. Because we are afraid of feeling lonely. But here's what Jesus does, and I, and I really, really appreciate it. Not only does Jesus call him out of the community, Jesus invites him into another one. Right? He doesn't just leave him out there by himself. A lot of us think as Christians we are called to be lonely. We are not. And we're not called to be in contention with every single person we run into or in opposition to everything all the time. But we are called out so that we can become a part of the body of Christ. So that we all find our place in that body. And it's hard to try and stay somewhere you've been called out of, especially when you belong somewhere else. Many of us are searching for belonging and connection through trying to rekindle things that have already burned out. Let me bring it into more relevant terms. You know when you leave a relationship, and I'm, I'm talking about like romantic relationships, you don't return back to your ex. Yeah, watch this, exactly, right, but here. You see what happened, right? You see what happened? And why? Why would we do such a thing? Why would we do such a thing? It's familiar. Guess what? Many of us have become familiar with being mistreated. Uh-oh. We become familiar with being mistreated. We become familiar with being seen as our mistakes. We identify so much with that. That's like, oh, I, I get that. I get toxicity. I can handle that. <laughs> Safety and security? No, I don't want that. I get being stuck. I know that. But progress? No, I don't want any of that. I get ghosting people and ghosting relationships because I don't feel like it's working out. But staying in relationships because they're tough? I don't want any of that. I get being in a room full of people and get feeling lonely. But being somewhere where I actually feel accepted and loved? No, I don't want any of that. I just wonder if today we can make the same declaration. 
Because that's essentially what this man did. He said, you know what? Matter of fact, I'm over it. I'm not going to sit here and have y'all mistreat me like this anymore. I'm not going to go back to that. If we can make that same declaration, just make that internal commitment. I won't go back. I won't go back to asking why so much so that I'm not willing to see what God is capable of doing in response to the circumstances. That I won't go back to accepting blames for things that are not my fault. That I won't go back to being seen as my mistakes and my shortcomings or as my past and not being seen as who I currently am. That I won't go back to fighting to be accepted by people who've already told me that they don't see me, that they don't love me, that they don't understand, and better yet, that they don't care. I won't go back to that. But instead, I will allow myself to be called out and called into this body of Christ in which we all have a part. Right? God sets in the body as it pleases God. The hand can't say to the feet, I don't need you. The mouth can't say to the eyes, I don't need you. And we, you and I, can't say to each other that we don't need each other. Uh, ben, you can start coming up here. Um, it reminds me of a gospel song. I'm not going to sing it. Uh, but by Hezekiah Walker, it's called I Need You to Survive. I need you to survive. We are all a part of God's body. It is God's will that every need be supplied. You are. You are important to me. I need you to survive. God calls us out of dependence and out of independence into interdependence. We recognize that we need one another, that we are with one another, and that we help determine the outcome for one another. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.